Uh, we're in a series called Winning the War Within. We're studying the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and turn to Galatians 5, verse 16 and 17, and then verse 22 and 24. And at the end of my message today, uh, I'm having my amazing friends, Fred and Judy Saxelby, who are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary next year. How cool is this? And they're going to share their journey and their story, and you'll see how it ties in here in just a minute. So let's go Galatians chapter 5, 16 and 17. We'll We'll get through as much as we can today uh, before Fred and Judy come up and share. It says this, live by the Spirit. I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, for what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh, for these are in war with each other to prevent you to do what you want to do. Verse 22, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, we've had a lot of amazing messages take place as we shared these different qualities that are really byproducts of God's Spirit working in your life. Life, and we finally have worked our way to self-control. Probably the least desirable quality that many of us want to talk about. Why? Because we have desires in our life that we want to gratify and we don't want to resist. We all know that we're in desperate need of it. Now, self-control has been studied in nauseam for the last past several decades. But one of the most famous tests that were done on the study of self-control, they started to ask the question, when does self-control start? When are we actually able to access this? quality, and when does it begin, and can it be developed, or can it be matured? So these psychologists in Stanford came up with this test in the 1960s, and this is what the test was called. The preschool self-imposed delay of immediate gratification for the sake of delayed but more valued rewards paradigm. It's quite a test. It takes a degree just to even say that out loud, right? So this test became the most famous test ever done to measure and evaluate self-control. So there's been many reiterations done of this. So here's a video of what that test has become. The marshmallow test is a really great way to show how children delay gratification. We had each child on their own sit at the table at a desk with uh, a plate and one marshmallow. They could either choose to eat the marshmallow, the one marshmallow right then and there, or they could wait until I came back into the room and have two marshmallows. I left them alone in the room for 15 minutes. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> uh, they take these children and they started to place in them what they call a hot temptation. Now, in normal temptation, there are hypothetical temptations that we'll do, and they found that. Gender actually plays a role in hypothetical temptations where females will often resist temptation more than males. However, if the temptation is in the flesh, gender does not matter. That you'll give into the temptation at hand if you can access it, taste it, touch it, or grab it immediately. But here was the amazing finding in this study. The children who were willing to delay gratification and waited to receive the second marshmallow ended up having higher SAT scores, lower levels of substance abuse, lower likelihood of obesity, better responses to stress, better social skills, and reported by their parents general better behavior. They then watched these lives for 40 years. And they found that those that actually delayed gratification led lives that were considered to be successful. But then the question became, can self-control be developed? Can we actually develop self-control? Or are those that give in to temptation young doomed to these lives of destruction? But they've learned that self-control is a muscle that you have to work. It's something that you have to develop. But what we're noticing now is that our world is so filled with temptations that we're literally becoming known as a nation of addicts. 
We are a nation that is defined by our addiction. Now, when we talk about addiction, we often think of substances that are illegal. But the addictions that our culture is succumbed to are what we're known as legal addictions. Here's a list of the top 10 legal addictions that we battle today. Prescription drugs, cigarettes, and alcohol. The top three are pretty normative. We would assume that. Number four comes in pornography, gambling, fast food, celebrity gossip, online gaming, television, and shopping. So what we're noticing is that we often turn to these temptations when we reach a season of stress. So if we're in a stress state, that's when our alleviation from that stress comes, we go to temptation for that release or for that gratification. And there's a cycle that's created. Here's this uh, temptation cycle we can look at. When you have a stress, you tend to turn to a hot system temptation. That's something for immediate gratification or stress release. But unfortunately, when we give in to those temptations that are often negative, there are negative emotions that come. The more we give in to those temptations long term, we then create long term distress that is resulting in depression. Out of that depression cycle, we have a loss of control where it feels like many of the things in our life are no longer able to be controlled because we can't control ourselves. We then enter into chronic stress, resulting in what we know as toxicity. Now, how do we find if we're in a toxic state? If you're in a crisis, watch what you immediately turn to. Now, one of the most shocking studies that was done just recently, I saw this. How many remember the nuclear scare in Hawaii a couple months ago? So we can watch responses of what happens. Once the nuclear scare happened, a website called Pornhub releases their statistics there was a 5,000 increase in percentage of hits right after the Hawaiian nuclear crisis. Literally, the immediate response of the culture in their stress state was to pornography. And as they watched the isolated hit count of the country, it appeared as if the entire state went to turn to porn in their place of stress. Our culture has reached a state of toxicity. We've reached a state where we're helpless. Now, it's easy for us as believers to point the finger at a culture and say, man, I can't believe it. We have to understand this reveals the plate of desperation and need for rescue that our culture's in. What they're showing is this. We literally are in such a toxic place that we have nowhere else to run for relief of the pain that we're trying to cure inside. There's nowhere else to turn to, and we're going to abase desires to try to meet that place of gratification or satisfaction in life. Now, let's go back to that top 10 list. If you read through these, you'll notice there is one missing. Any guess? Marijuana and coffee. (laughs) There we go. Social media is not on the top 10 list. Why is it not on the top 10 list? Because it's almost not even being considered an addiction, but a lifestyle integration. It's so dramatic that they're noticing that our brain patterns as a culture are changing because of our use for social media. Now, we can often think, I'm not addicted to social media, but here are the stats that are common today. The average person has five social media accounts and spends nearly two hours a day browsing between accounts. So what we're doing is this. We're creating multiple accounts on multiple platforms to say, I'm not addicted to one of these things. You'll say, I'm not addicted to Instagram, but yet Facebook and Snapchat and others are your utilization or your resources that you turn to. So we automatically think, well, I'm not addicted. Here are the three ways to tell if you are starting to begin an addiction to social media. Here we go. It just got real quiet. Number one, this is what studies are showing. If you begin to cook to share your photo of your food on Instagram. They say that starting to take pictures of your food and showing it to your friends is the beginning stages of a social media addiction. Where you're literally trying to post what you're... If you really think about this, now how many have done it before? You've taken your food selfie. Think about this, trying to explain this a couple hundred years prior that one day future generations will take pictures of food to show other friends what they're not eating. This is a psychosis. 
This is not a healthy behavior. Now, I get it if you're a chef, but to show what you're eating it in and out is not some hierarchy of superiority or great accomplishment that we've achieved. Number two, sharing everything you do during your day as a diary. How many have known this? We don't care if you're going to the grocery store, the mall, or the gym. No one needs to know. But we continue to take photos of where we are as if people really care where we are. If you're doing something really significant, yes, I get it, but I don't need to see you at Starbucks every other day getting your latte. But we're creating these brain patterns of addiction in our life that are often associated with stimuluses. The last one, you say, you know what, I've finally been set free. I'm, I'm really not succumbed to any of these. Number three, knowing everything about people you don't know very well. Facebook and Instagram stalking. It <laughs> got real quiet. <laughs> these are all signs to show that addictive behavior is happening. And what we tend to do is we go to these different addictions to alleviate the stress that our culture is surrounded in. Now, as they continue to study self-control and they continue to look at addiction, the question has been asked, is this a generational thing? Is the fact that we're giving this self-control, is it generational? Is it just these millennials or these Gen Z? But here's what they've noticed. There is research that shows people still have the same self-control as in decades past, but we are bombarded more and more with temptations that our psychological system is not set up to deal with and all the potential immediate gratification. Our brains are so overwired with temptations and advertisement that our systems are shutting down. See, self-control is an exhaustible resource. It has a finite strength test to it. You can really exhaust it. So what we've learned culturally is that if we can bombard the individual with advertisements and things they want, they'll eventually wear out and buy what we want them to buy. So our culture, here's what we have to understand. Nothing is free. It always comes at the cost of something. So the moment a platform, a new service comes out that's free, it's not free, friends. But it's at the expense of our lives, of our livelihood, of our families. And we have this war taking place where we do behaviors we know we don't want to do, but we have succumbed to what the book of Proverbs has written. Proverbs 25, 28. Like a city breached without walls is one who lacks self-control. We are these defenseless cities that are standing left vulnerable to any temptation that will come our way. Now, this idea of temptation and giving in to a lack of self-control goes back to early Greek philosophy. It was this word, akrasia, or akrasia. It means the absence of power. So you have Plato and Aristotle and Socrates all writing about this plague of the human condition where we don't have power to overcome our temptations. And it was believed that if you were a religious, religious elite or if you were one of the Stoics or one of those that were known as wise, that you'd overcome this condition, this akrasia. But only Jesus, leave it up to Jesus to explain Expose the lies of the culture. He says this in Matthew 23, 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. He uses the word akrasia. He says, even though they have these lives that appear to be free from temptations and giving in to abased desires, they are full of greed and self-indulgence on the inside. No one is free from this. They begin to write about the need for this in power, to be in power, the word for self-control. And as you study this word self-control in the early first century, the primary writings on self-control were Christian. These were the primary ones that would write about it. We were the only ones that had the inside track and the secret to self-control. And how do we know this? Acts 23. We then have Paul Go before Governor Felix, and as he stands trial before him, capture this, Acts 24, verse 25, it says this, as he discussed justice, self-control, and the coming judgment, Felix became frightened and said, go away for the present. I have an opportunity for you. I will send for you. So what happens here? Paul's then before this governor on trial 
What's his primary message? When you think about what you would say to someone in power that's never understood the gospel, Paul begins to speak on self-control as one of the anchors of the New Testament gospel. This is one of his things. And it's so frightening that Governor Felix is overwhelmed with conviction. He has to send Paul away. Why? Because self-control was linked to the coming judgment. What he began to say was this. You deal with this acrasia. You deal with this lack of self-control. Don't you know you'll be held accountable for the desires you give into? You'll actually be held accountable before a God that is real that will look at your life, but the only way to access it is a relationship with Jesus. The only way to access this self-control was a relationship with the God that created you. And he began to share his gospel. And what was the secret behind their discovery of self-control? Well, Paul reveals it. Now, when you look up self-control in the New Testament, you're not going to find very many passages that describe it. But what you understand is that the theme is interwoven throughout. So what was the secret of the first century church to access this self-control, to solve this problem that philosophy could not? Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The secret to self-control that the apostles discovered through the testimony of Jesus was crucifixion. You had to die to yourself. The secret of self-control is dying to that self-control or that selfishness or that self-obsession that's overtaking your life. See, as I studied countless books this week, secular psychology books to Christian books, there was a real epiphany I came across that if I wasn't a believer, I would feel helpless in my journey with self-control. You're helpless because my self-control is an exhaustible resource and temptations are more readily available than they've ever been in human history. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, you have no way to deny the temptations that are coming over you. And from this place of confidence and saying, you know what? You want the secret for self-control? You want the secret of a crasia? Guess what? You have to die to yourself. You have to put yourself on your cross. As Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. This is a message that not a lot of us really like to hear because there's actual implications that come from this. This means preferring others. This means, as Peter used to, or John used to say, behold, he must increase, but I have to decrease. We love ourselves a lot. We love our routines. We love our schedules. We love our desires. We love things, especially if things get in our way or impose on our schedule, you start to see that little self come out. You start to see it rear its ugly head. But Jesus says, if you really want growth and life and godliness, you got to put yourself on the cross. You got to die to these desires. And from that place, we have accesses to promises like 1 Corinthians chapter 10. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. Behold, God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also, what? Provide a way of escape so that you can endure it. You have access to self-control. We often hope that God comes with this magic wand and just wipes away the temptation. That's not how it works. If he didn't do it for Jesus in Matthew 4, guess what? He's going to empower you to overcome the temptations that are at hand. But you see, the enemy knows how to get you. He looks for those weaknesses and those vulnerabilities. He's prowling around like a lion, the Bible says, looking who he may devour, who he may consume. But we have a God who's able to overcome that temptation alongside of you. And he says, guess what? Anytime you are tempted, you have access to escape that temptation. Practical things. I want to challenge you. When you identify those temptations, all of us have them, and this is really going to be an introspective work you have to do. Identify the temptation and start to watch. I guarantee you, every time a temptation comes, there's an opportunity to leave it. 
every time. There's always an interruption. There's always an unwelcomed phone call. I remember when I was with uh, my, my wife at the time, we were engaged, and I was hanging out with her alone. It just so happened that no one was home, and we're hanging out, and things started to get a little, uh, a little, a little hot and heavy in there. And all of a sudden, my phone rings, and my friend Clayton, who's my accountability partner, calls. He says, where are you at? I said, I'm at home. He's like, who are you with? I'm with Rachel. He's like, is anybody else with there? Like, no. He's like, get out of the house. He just had a sense. He had a knowing. See, God always provides a way of escape. Now, would my friend show up at my front door to make sure I got out of the house? No. But there was a way for escape that took place. There's an opportunity for what they call hot temptations, to resist those hot system temptations that we all face. And as I begin to study, one last major point here before Fred and Judy share. The secret to self-control, out of all the little navigations and guides and nuances that I read, the number one thing that was a common theme in every book was the secret to self-control is your mindset. Your mind is the key to self-control. Now, from a new age or secular philosophy standpoint, I understand. They're trying to talk about this nuanced mind. But here's the beautiful thing. We have access to a renewed mind by the Holy Spirit. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. That by the testing of your faith, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, God knows that we need self-control, and where it starts is the war within your mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The God of this age has blinded what? The minds of unbelievers. See, he knows, the enemy knows that the war is at the mind, where you face and what you come across and what you're going against. If he can blind your mind, he knows it affects the way you live and behave. Here's what one psychologist said, the one that actually founded the marshmallow test. He says, self-control isn't achieved by toughing it out or saying no, but by changing the way we think. The way we think determines how we behave. What you believe determines how you behave and what you lift out. And what they've noticed is this, is that we actually have to adopt, catch this language, an overcoming mindset. We have to begin to adopt a mindset to overcome. Because a lot of us, if we've reached a state of toxicity in an area of addiction, we think that we're helpless. We think that we can't do everything. But Jesus gives us this promise of 1 John chapter 5. For everyone who has been born of God, what? Overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. When you trust in God, he gives you the power to overcome the temptations at hand. One of the practical things I came across this week as I studied is that when you have a temptation that is primary, you have to create what's called an if-then strategy. If you're in contact with one of those temptations, you say, if this happens, then I will blank. And you have to rehearse it out loud. It can't be one of those things where you hope it works out when the temptation's coming. So if your temptation is when you're home, no one else is there to look at pornography, you have to say these things. If no one is home but me, then I will leave the house. If no one is home but me, then I will lock my phone in the safe. Whatever you have to do to avoid the temptation at hand, because here's the reality, your life is at stake. Your life, your livelihood, your love, your family is at stake. We can't just go nice with these sins, because guess what? The enemy ain't playing nice. He's after you. He goes to seek, kill, and destroy. Death is coming after you with the sting of sin. We have to create those defenses. We have to create those walls. Now, there is a, a, a real um, chemical reality to the temptations we have. Here's a picture of what we call a brain dendrite. Do we have this picture here? Here we go. So here's a thought in your brain as they've navigated this. And a, and a great resource for you to look at is a woman named Dr. Carolyn Leaf. She's a believer. She has a book called Switch On Your Brain. She has a lot of exploration here. To the left is a thought in your brain. It's called the dendrite. So when you have a thought that you entertain, it starts to create a, a tree stem in your brain. Well, this tree stem needs to get fed. And over time, as those thoughts are exercised and rehearsed, they grow into these dendrite trees. 
Now, if you've been an addict for a long time in an area of substance or just even thought life, you have a dendrite tree stem that's, that's grown in your brain. It's the reality. Now, the way to get rid of it is you have to replace it with a new thought, i.e. renewed mind, and you have to starve it out so it can be removed. You have to starve the thought. A lot of us just say, I'm not going to do something. But again, our brain chemistry creates ways for us to work around it. And what they've noticed is this. Those that struggle with nicotine or tobacco addiction will say this, I'm never going to buy a cigarette again. And what do they do? They find ways to get them from their friends. They work around. Guys, we're smart people. And your brain is smarter than you are sometimes. And it works its way around to make you do things. You've all, we've all said, I'm never going to eat that again. I promise I will not eat that box of cupcakes in the freezer. We find a way for your children to open the freezer for you. And just so happens it falls right on your plate at the table. We all have these things that we rehearse, but God gives us the strength to overcome them. And it starts with what? taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Final verse here, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not in the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Destroy those strongholds in the mind. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God by taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You have to identify what's that area of temptation that you struggle with. We have to begin to take those thoughts captive. And the last part was they said this, self-control can never be developed in isolation. You have to have others come alongside of you. Community is an essential part for self-control development. You have to have people that you invite on the journey with you. If you have an addiction, if you have an area of struggle, you have a family on your left and right that's here to help you. Not to judge you, not to shame you, but to help you overcome with what God wants you to get set free from. He does not desire for you to be bound or held captive by these areas of temptation. Now, here's the reality we face in culture. What the Bible calls sin, the world does not. So there may be many things that are legal and accessible that are not healthy, that are not really what the life that God's called you to live. You need to overcome these temptations with others along your side to help you take those thoughts and lies and toxic thinking captive. Well, one area of self-control that we did not discuss too much, I went to my friends Fred and Judy, and I thought, okay, who has lived a life of self-control? I can share with my limited experiences, but we're talking to somebody that's been married almost 50 years. You know they've had to develop some self-control in their life. So I had them pray. And they said, you know what? As we prayed, God highlighted this particular area in our life that we want to share about. So would you welcome Fred and Judy as they share their journey? Let's give it up for Fred and Judy. Come on now. For uh, nearly 50 years, G and I have experienced many wins and losses in the area of self-control. But before we share some of those, these, we need to tell you something about our contrasting selves. Judy is very outgoing and friendly. Fred is quiet but polite. Judy is very spontaneous and a party, ready to happen. <laughs> Fred is not typically spontaneous, and in reality, he's very boring. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Judy is an attractive dresser. Whereas Fred does not have a clue of what he should wear. <laughs> she picked out my clothes this morning. <laughs> Judy is an active talker. While Fred is an active listener. <laughs> Judy is like a fish in the water. While Fred is like a frog who is sitting on a lily pad just watching. <laughs> True. Judy is very compassionate. While well, Fred has become more sensitive to others over the years. Judy tolerates numbers. While well, Fred loves doing endless tax returns. <laughs> As you can see, we are very opposite in many ways. 
This is only a short list of our differences. Because of these differences, we've had our share of conflicts and arguments, especially about finances throughout the years. I will share more about our financial disagreements in a few minutes. Yes, we are very human. There have been times when we've had to speak the truth and love to one another, and times when we've had to ask one another for forgiveness. There have been times when both of us have thought, I really love you, but right now, I don't like you. <laughs> because our differences, of our differences, both of us give the Lord Jesus Christ the credit for sustaining our marriage. He is our rock. He is the one who gives us grace to love and to submit to one another. Despite these many differences, there is one major way in which we were a hundred percent we are a hundred percent alike. And that is after we received Jesus Christ in 1968 during the Jesus movement and got married, we determined that we were going to live for him and set our affections on things above, not on the things of the earth. Judy and I did not come from Christian homes. So when we received Jesus, as our Savior, we wanted everyone to come to know his forgiveness, his love, his fellowship, his power, his grace. And I might add, he also gave us a purpose for living. When we came to know Christ, we were completely changed. It was like a revolution in our lives. We had come to know Christ, the bread of life, the one who is the living water. We had found the pearl of great price. Everything changed, completely changed in our lives. Uh, as soon as we could, we found some evangelists. We wanted to start supporting. And also, once we started attending a local church, we started to tithe because we wanted the community to hear about Jesus. With these uh, goals in mind, um, setting our affections on things above, treasures, laying up treasures in heaven, um, as newlyweds, by the grace of God, we made some good financial decisions, and we knew we'd have to really rely on the Lord to follow through on those decisions. So one of those decisions was that we would never have a debt beyond a house payment. That meant we would never get a car loan or buy anything on time but pay cash for everything. Besides these things, we decided that even though I have a college degree, I would be a full-time homemaker so that I could spend a lot of time with our children. Fred was a high school teacher most of his working years, so he was our only source of income. Another thing we decided was if our finances increased, we would maintain a modest standard of living. We thank the Lord that he has given us the self-control or the discipline um, to follow through with these decisions. The only debt that we ever had was for the modest track house that we bought 41 years ago in Citrus Heights. We happily paid it off 29 years ago. I say we because Judy had a part-time house cleaning business for a couple of years that helped eliminate the mortgage. Because we have been debt-free for the past 29 years, we thank the Lord that we have been able to give more love offerings to feed the hungry to feed hungry children, to help widows, to support missionaries, as well as to help educate children in other countries. We also thank the Lord that we have extra funds to, we've been on uh, 10 mission trips the last five years. And one thing that has practically kept us on course is a budget. 40 years ago, started a budget. This is a copy of it, 1978. <laughs> $900 in spendable income was our net for the month, and we figured it out to the dollar. And it had 13 categories. It was very basic. Now the last one for July 2018 had about 33 different categories. So I'm pushing a budget. You can accomplish your goals that God has put on your heart if you have a budget, if you have a way of tracking your expenses. And if you come to the end of the month or close to it, say, oh, I want to buy this. Well, the budget says it's all gone, so the answer is no. I have to say, there were some years that were very lean. We'll talk about those in a minute, that 
I, we rant, and I'm sure this happens to you also, you have more month than you have money <laughs> left. And so at those times, God was faithful. We prayed, and, and God provided. People would bring extra food over. We had cars given to us at times. And it was really, um, it was really awesome for our children to see God's faithfulness through those times. So anyway, I have to say, financial boundaries, keeping those, was def- were a, a challenge for me and coming into alignment with Fred in this area because he was extremely frugal, (laughs) much more than I. And so I I had to die to self a lot and um, grow in the area of communications, learning, you know, to say to my husband what my needs were and also coming into contentment. So it was a very long process. Um, One of my weaknesses Probably my biggest one was, was clothes. I love to buy clothes, and um, Fred didn't think that was very important. <laughs> um, so we had some major uh, disagreements, um, heated arguments on how to spend discretionary funds, which in the beginning weren't very much. There was actually a time when my allowance was $10 a month, so you know we didn't have a lot to disagree on, but we did. And... Uh, <laughs> Another area of conflict early on in our marriage was I thought it was time to buy a home. We'd been in an apart- living in an apartment after college graduation for three and a half years, and we'd had our first child, and I just felt it was time. And Fred said no because um, I'm not employed full-time yet as a teacher. He was still subbing. And um, so anyway, that was very upsetting to me. And I just didn't want to live in an upstairs downtown Sacramento apartment with a young child. But at this point, um, I did have some hope because Fred's frugality in college had paid off. He'd saved all of his earnings in high school and college working at a lumber mill. And so we did have the down payment. Well, as it turned out, it was a rough year for me, but in the end... Um, I did learn to deal with some very strong emotions. I had a lot of lack. I had um, a lack of self-control in my emotions, especially anger. And I would exhibit and display a lot of rage during those early years of our marriage, which was shocking to Fred. Um, <laughs> I t- would throw things and um, break things. <laughs> Not at him. I didn't throw things at him, although I did hit him once. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> this was not something I'm proud of, but, you know, just to be honest, you know, this is an area where I needed to grow in self-control. And one thing that helped me is I realized I was devastating people around me and hurting my children. Well, I only had one at that time, but um, it was... Um, it was very difficult, and so when I was stressed living in this little apartment and run down, kind of not really too bad, but um, with a small child, a lot of that anger came out, and it was an area where I had to really get real with God, and um, had a lot of self-pity also, a lot of tears, a lot of begging and pleas, and so um, through the process, I learned to die to self. And God helped me to be content in that apartment for another year. I just was really a work that he did in me. And that has been challenged over the years. Obviously, still continues to be a challenge because, as I said, we're very human. And so there's a process of dying to self. It's an ongoing thing. You know, it's like never over. And you have to get to a place of just surrender again and again. And so one thing that has helped me over the years is giving thanks to the Lord. And just um, one thing I really struggled with, too, was um, I had severe acne as a young woman and an adult. And I finally came to a point where I could look in the mirror and just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. And um, he changed my bitter, angry heart to one of thanksgiving. And, it was a, and after that, he healed my skin, too. It cleared up. So it was really cool. <laughs> so 
So giving thanks and then now going to Haiti, that um, really keeps me in line as far as my lust for material things. <laughs> that uh, makes a difference. You know, I really think twice when I think, oh, I'd really like that or this, that, the other. And um, I go, hmm, you know, <laughs> I have running water. I have indoor plumbing. I'm rich. <laughs> So anyway, um, let's see, where was I? I got way off, so um, giving thanks. Okay, eventually we attended some financial seminars. This is where the Holy Spirit imparted vision for paying the house off early. And so frugality eventually became a way of life um, as we committed to paying the house off early. Also, I read an inspiring book, which I highly recommend. It was by the Mennonites called Living More with Less. And it actually became kind of a game and fun for me to see how we could cut back, cut corners. And uh, the kids weren't always so thrilled about this. <laughs> we hung all our clothes on the clothesline. Can you imagine? Even the baby diapers. <laughs> and so I had my younger children with our fourth child hanging out diapers on the clothesline. Anyway. Eight years later, Fred quit teaching at the high school in Sacramento, became the principal of our Christian school. This meant decreasing our in expenses even more since his income was cut in half. And finally, as I grew and matured as a Christian, I was finding my true source of life in Jesus and wanting even more to lay up treasures in heaven. In fact, we were thinking when we were thinking of having our third child, the Lord impressed on me my true treasure would be our children and family and not material things. Growing in contentment and an eternal perspective was key to choosing a path of self-control. 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And bringing our sharing to a close, and bringing our sharing to a close, I want to mention another very important point about our monthly budget. As previously said, you and I had agreement on our major financial decisions, no debt, uh, tithing, giving to missionaries, etc. However, our arguments about money had to do with discretionary monthly funds and how we should spend them. During many of these arguments, I'm sorry to say I did not exercise self-control. I was insensitive to Judy's needs. Finally, after not, uh, finally, about nine years ago, we finally wised up and came up with a very simple solution. Each one of us would get a monthly allowance, and we could spend it any way we wanted. It could be spent for clothing, her favorite, recreational fees, eating out with a friend or taking an art class, etc. We decided that we would not hassle or question one another about our chosen expenses. It has eliminated our arguments over discretionary spending. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> And thanks for allowing Judy and I to share about our journey about having self-control in the area of finances. Thank you. So let's stand together. <clears throat> Amazing job, Fred and Judy. Let's just stay standing. I'm going to invite the prayer team down. Just to think, come down the front as we stay standing. We're just going to pray as we close here this morning. Father, we just thank you for uh, the amazing journey you've taken us on. And God, we thank you for the testimony of Fred and Judy and the power of a life that was lived well and has been living well and has a bright future ahead. God, we thank you for that, just that picture of what it can look like to be in our latter years and living on mission, trusting you for your provision in our life. And God, we just lift up those areas of self-control regarding temptations that we face. God, as we look at that list of substance abuse and shopping and pornography, food addictions, God, we just pray right now that you would come and give us strategy, that you give us power. Lord, that you would highlight people that we need to invite in the process to help overcome. God, that you would give us that uh, identification as if there's any other secondary things in our life or environmental changes that need to happen. Holy Spirit, we pray for empowerment, that God, you can give us the strength to overcome. We choose to die to self and die to the desires that dominate our life. We say yes to you and your lordship. God, we thank you for your leadership in our life. So God, would you do a great work in this church? In Jesus' name, amen.